Since 2003, Young has served as Vondi's executive director, helping, helping the organization to solidify and grow its place as an integral part of the neighborhood in which it resides. Indeed, Fondi's mission is to connect Northside Milwaukee to local healthy food from the farm to the table. The organization fulfills its mission by operating the city's largest farmer's market, food stamp and produce consumption incentive programs, by promoting cooking education, and most recently, by overseeing an 80-acre vegetable farm in nearby Port Washington. Fondi Food Center is also a founding member of the Lindsay Heights Neighborhood Health Alliance, an innovative consortium of nonprofits and residents working to improve the health and well being of Northside Milwaukee citizens. Young is the recipient of the 2006 Wisconsin Hunger Hero Award and the 2012 Doug Jansen Emerging Milwaukee Leader Award. In 2013, he was named Owner of the Year by Outpost, Outpost Natural Foods Cooperative. He is the food systems columnist for Milwaukee's leading urbanist news website, urbanmilwaukee.com. Before moving to Milwaukee, Young spent eight years in Seattle, working with that city's homeless population. His corporate job experiences include stints as a custom bicycle, <laughs> sorry, Young, as a custom bicycle wheel builder and racing bicycle component buyer with factories in the Far East. And I believe, was that for Trek? Did you work for Trek? Specialized, sorry. Um, a second generation Korean American who was born and raised in the American Deep South, Young is always on the lookout for culturally significant recipes. When he's not thinking of food history and food justice, he likes to restore vintage fountain pens. Young is a graduate of Oberlin College where he distinguished himself not only as the most popular resident of our freshman dorm, Barrows, um, and a fine student as well in East Asian studies, um, but also as an all-American swimmer. He lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It gives me great pleasure to turn the podium over to Young Kim. Thank you, Margie. Um, thank you, Roosevelt University uh, and the Center for New Deal Studies. Thank you for, uh, to Joel Blyfus and the uh, In These Times magazine. Um, Jumping right into things, um, we've all heard the term food desert, right? Um, in Milwaukee, we have whole sections of our city, usually in poor parts of town, where you cannot buy a head of cabbage if you wanted to. Um, and there are reasons why. This is Magic Foods here, which is not far from my, uh, my office, the owner. If he wanted to stock cabbage, he could not buy cabbage. No wholesaler in town will sell uh, to him. Um, cabbages, if you want to buy cabbage from a, a wholesaler, you have to buy them by the case. And cases start at around uh, 24 heads uh, per case. And no corner store can really sell through two, 24 heads of cabbage without, before they go bad. So um, the system that is set up to supply food to retailers is, is not really geared for these small corner stores, but they're, they're what we have. Um, so that fresh food scarcity combined with a lack of reliable tra personal transportation makes it hard to eat the fresh fruits and vegetables that you need to eat a healthy diet. And so we do see the diet-related health problems in the inner city um, in, of Milwaukee uh, disproportionately high. Uh, this is a report from the Center for Urban Population Health showing um, it, uh, the red bar is for lower socioeconomic status Milwaukee, green is middle, and blue is higher. So this shows that 60% of the stores in Milwaukee, food retail stores, have fewer than five employees in, in poorer parts of Milwaukee, whereas for the higher income uh, neighborhoods, about 9% of the food retailers have fewer than five employees. So when you have fewer than five employees, you know, you, you know that it's mainly potato chips, uh, hot pockets, frozen pizza, milk that is a couple of days away from expiring, if not already expired, brown bananas, um, meat that's not good. And so we have our Fondy Farmers Market. Uh, it's about, it has about $780,000 a year in sales. Um, 21 farmers, uh, 10 hot food vendors. It is quite the hopping place in town. 
Um, it has its roots at the Center Street Haymarket from 1917 to 1980. Um, this was a very German part of town. Early photographs of this farmer's market shows uh, rows and rows of dead rabbits with the skin still on, hanging upside down from pegs. Um, and then with white flight in the 60, 50s and 60s, um, the neighborhood turned into the predominantly African-American neighborhood that uh, we have today. This is um, a comic that I used a lot um, to illustrate something. It's from Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. Is, is there anyone familiar with it? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Um, and, uh, you know, the x-axis is knowledge about a certain topic. The y-axis is willingness to opine on a certain topic. An, an e easy example of this, my first encounter, well, a significant encounter with Mount Stupid was before I had a kid. If I saw a kid having a temper tantrum at the grocery store, of course I was I was going to tell you that there is no discipline in the house, you know? And my kid will never do that. And then, uh, then my kid was born, and then I started coming down the, down the other side of Mount Stupid, not so willing to give my opinion on, on child rearing. Uh, my daughter is now 14, and I'm still somewhere in that trough there. Um, so, that, but it's, it's a useful illustration. Uh, my most profound encounter with Mount Stupid, my most profound professional encounter with Mount Stupid, uh, was about nine years ago. I was two years into my term uh, at the helm of my agency, and we'd received a grant to run uh, healthy cooking demonstrations at a local food pantry um, in, a, in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. And I was dicing some onions to prepare for the demonstration. And it was spring, so the onions were really, had been in storage. Uh, they were really pungent. Uh, tears were just streaming down my face. And a woman who's standing in line to get her free bag of produce um, took one look at me and she said, you're cutting them wrong. So I handed her the knife. And I stepped back. And so she took the whole onion, cut it in half, and then pull, peeled the skin back to the root. She didn't tear the skin off. And uh, she just went chop, 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 and it was done. Um, she said, do it this way. If your knife is dull, uh, you don't have to, if your fingers are out of the way, you're not going to have to worry so much about cutting yourself. You'll be able to chop faster, and uh, you, know, you're, you won't cry so much. And I asked her how she learned, and she said, well, I cooked in a restaurant for 30 years. Um, the rest of the feedback after I made it, made the dish, and I was feeding uh, to people at the food bank, uh, I think you put too much salt in it, or uh, you know, if you added more garlic, it would taste better, or if you put in spices, then you could take the salt out. Um, it was disconcerting feedback. And so the next, you know, as I went to bed, I was just really uneasy. And the next morning, I woke up going, just who is helping who? And so, you know, I, I was on the other side of Mount Stupid. And, you know, as executive directors, I don't know if any of you are executive directors, but, you know, when you're trying to get funding for things, you need to present yourself as the expert on food deserts. And um, here I was my experience was telling me that uh, this, this project that I thought was so cool was actually uh, a program that was more aimed at a stereotype than really um, the, what the community was. And so I started exploring. And what I found was, as I got to know people, uh, I found the most food opinionated collection of people I've ever met. Uh, this is me coming from a family of foodies. Um, Greens, collard greens are a very popular thing in our farmer's market, and I would routinely see uh, people leaving with industrial-sized garbage bags full of collard greens. And I, uh, and I asked them, so are you going to eat all that today? And they said, no, um, we've learned how to blanch and freeze. Uh, people would take um, these big, enormous bunches of collard greens, mustard greens, spinach home, uh, and gather around a stove, get four pots of water going, uh, you, you wash the vegetables, you dunk them in the boiling water for 30 seconds, fish it out, run it under ice water or, or cold water, squeeze all the water out, stick it in two layers of freezer bags, throw it in your freezer, and that's, that's how you preserve the season. 
Um, and uh, a woman showed me her freezer, and she opened it, and it was a wall of green. She said, those are all fondue vegetables. I'm all set for the, for the, for the winter. Um, I said, but you know, that's a lot of greens. There's a lot of sand in that. How are you going to get the sand out? And she said, oh, no. Uh, I just put them in my washing machine on gentle cycle, which a washing machine on gentle cycle is like a giant uh, salad spinner, you know? <laughs> And that, that's just genius. I could not have come up with that. Uh, what happens you know, with the, with the African-American migration up north, um, you know, people realized that, there, that the growing season in Wisconsin was May to November, as opposed to you know, in Mississippi or Arkansas, you know, um, 10, 11 months out of the year. So they had to come up with, uh, with ways to have the foods that were significant to them that they wanted. And um, you know. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and I could not have come up with that. Um, <clears throat> I also learned that most of the cooks in Milwaukee before the civil rights era, if you went into the back of a restaurant in Milwaukee, most of the faces were African American. Um, and then uh, during, after the civil rights era, you know, the idea of cooking someone else's meal suddenly seemed very old school. And so um, the, the restaurant help in the back of a restaurant changed to the predominantly Hispanic one that we see today. Um, so there is cooking experience. Uh, a dinner at someone's house had some yummy potato pancakes, and afterwards, uh, as I was leaving, someone told me, well, you know, their grandmother used to cook for one of the uh, Jewish families in town, and what you actually ate was a latka. Um, so recipes have a funny way of, 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 uh, of um, sticking around. Um, I've had cooking demonstrations at our farmer's market where I watched and tried to write down everything. And um, afterwards, I go back to make sure my notes are right and um, had a very hard time getting her to tell me exactly how much of something to put in. I go home, I make it, and it doesn't taste the same as the dish that she served to me. And I, and I say, so you, you, I ran into her a week later and she said, uh, well, I left out the secret ingredient. Um, there's a lot of pride in the family recipes. Um, there was, um, so, uh, soul food, I believe, has gotten a bum rap as far as, uh, you know, people blame soul food for a lot of the inner city uh, health problems. I do think that uh, traditional soul food from um, the 40s and 50s, before our food system got industrialized, before it was so easy to get a bucket of chicken every day, um, a chicken, you had, to, you had to catch it, you had to kill it, you had to gut it, you had to pluck it, you had to fry it. I mean, that, those were once in a lifetime, uh, once in a while treats. They weren't meant to be eaten every day. And so I think a lot of, um, a lot of the health solutions when it comes to cooking, in, in, at least in, in Milwaukee, have to do with rediscovering the old ways of cooking, not going in um, with some I guess some shame-based nutrition education approach saying, uh, you know, the cultural food uh, that you like is killing you. I don't think that's the right message to give to people. Um, so we started doing events that affirm community eating traditions. Uh, we decided to make the whole farmer's market experience fun. And so for the past six years, we've had a barbecue cook-off to see which neighborhood backyard chef has the best uh, pork and uh, chicken barbecue recipe. Admittedly, it's not the most healthy thing, but anytime you can get a community talking about food and reminiscing about how things were, you know, this is an endorphin. <laughs> if, if people are begging me to be on the judging panel, um, anytime you can get people talking about food, it's a good thing. Um, you know. Collard greens, um, I've mentioned them. It, you know, they come from a time when the only meats made available to people were uh, made, made available by plantation owners were, you know, the parts of the pig no one wanted. Pig's feet, pig's ears, snouts, tails. Um, and so these meats were combined with the traditional African practice of braising leafy greens. And they created a soul food staple that um, is loved by many on Milwaukee's, uh, throughout the south, and especially on M Milwaukee's north side. So we started something called the Greens Throwdown. Uh, 
neighborhood chefs going head to head to see who have the uh, who has the best greens recipe. Uh, this is a 120 year old cast iron pot from Kemper County, Mississippi. Um, this is not a food desert. Uh, food desert implies that, that you know nothing is good is happening. Uh, that that things really need to be brought in wholesale, and. Um, you know, the lenses that we have when we apply them to communities, especially, uh, you know, so-called low-income or poor communities, we have to take those lenses off uh, because uh, there are a lot of strengths. There is a lot of resiliency in, in communities that uh, we don't know. So uh, collard greens throw down, 15 cooks going head to head. This is the blind, you know, no one knows whose is whose. Um, it's quite the contest. Half the recipes are vegetarian, many are salt-free. Um, and I'd love to say that, uh, you know, we've had something to do with it, no. Um, Grandma ha has diabetes, she can't have that as much salt as she like, but she still wants the, the foods that she knows. So, um, you know, the change, the grassroots change is happening by itself. Um, we haven't had to force people to eat arugula. Um, so, you know, early on, we were marketing the market as, as, you know, the market for the food desert. That's what our website said. And um, instead of calling it a food desert, we just said, heck, heck, we're trying to be the best farmer's market we can. And so we had a food stamp machine in 2003. The first year, we sold like a, uh, $650 worth of produce with uh, food stamps. And then, so when we switched to, you know, just marketing, the, the market as a market, as a fun place where uh, your eating traditions would be valued, um, food stamp sales started going through the roof. Uh, from 2008, we had about $8,000 last year, uh, 51000 um, which it, it's a significant portion of the income uh, for our farmers, and it is, um, I think, puts us fifth in the country in terms of food stamp sales. Um, Another encounter with Mount Stupid. Are you sensing a theme here? Um, have to do with Hmong farmers in Wisconsin. Um, this, the, the Hmong are from Southeast Asia. They are an indigenous group in Southeast Asia. Their experience is kind of analogous to Native Americans. They, they've kind of largely kept to themselves. Um, but they were recruited by the CIA to fight uh, um, there's what's called the secret war in parts of Southeast Asia, rescuing downed American chopper pilots, um, doing all sorts of missions. After the U.S. pulled out, uh, the Hmong were just basically hunted down and herded into camps um, in Thailand. And so we heard about their plight and um, brought them here. Um, they ended up in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and California. But before we go get it too much into the Hmong, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, this is me on my first birthday. Um, born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, raised in uh, New Orleans and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Infant mortality was really big and, um, in, in, in traditional Korea. So, you know, if your kid made it to the first birthday, that was a pretty big deal and they, you know, every kid I know who's Korean has this first, first birthday type of photo. And so Koreans traditionally aren't big on desserts. You know, they eat fruit. Um, but this is Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So what's in front of me, not just grapefruits and oranges and bananas and apples, but three kinds of donuts. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is, this is a snapshot of the Americanization process through food. You know, and yeah, I do love donuts. Um, so, that's me. And when I talk about Korea and the Hmong, you know, there's Thailand down there next to Vietnam. Korea is way, way up there uh, in the north. Um, we do not have much in common. It is like comparing the Irish and the Sicilians, uh, both populate. Is this on? Why did it go on? Should I just speak louder? So the 
Irish and the Sicilians, both populations uh, bake bread and eat with forks. That's about it, okay? <laughs> the Koreans and the Hmong, we both eat rice and we both use chopsticks, that's about it. So they were entirely new to me. It was a whole other Mount Stupid experience for me. 95% of the farmers at my market are Hmong. Uh, it's mainly because the neighborhood has a reputation of being a high crime area and uh, you know the so-called first tier farmers don't want to sell in a part of town where they're afraid of getting robbed. So as with a lot of immigrant groups who are able to fill in the cracks and go to places where no one else is willing to go, um, the Hmong have, have stepped in as farmers. And so when I arrived in Milwaukee in 2003, they're, the Hmong were a total mystery to me. And until 2003, I was really a city boy. Uh, the only experience that I had about farming was you know, what I saw on TV. Uh, people, people wearing uh, overalls, a uh, couple with a, you know, like a collie and a grain silo and, and um, acres and acres of identical looking plants planted in razor, razor, laser straight rows. And so when my, I began visiting and inspecting the growing operations of our farmers that supplied our market, um, I saw some really weird things. And it's taken me a while to understand what I saw. Uh, the rows that I saw were anything but straight. Certain leafy vegetables like salad, collard greens, mustard greens, they were actually even planted in rows. Um, they were broadcast seeded like you would broadcast seed a, a lawn. Um, I didn't see any tractors. The largest piece of equipment that I saw was a sad looking rototiller under um, some pl uh, plastic shower curtain to keep it from rusting. Um, where these Hmong farmers put their plants made no sense to me. Six tomato plants next to, next to some zucchini vines, followed by some watermelons, and then some cabbages and peppers and cantaloupes, and maybe another six tomato plants. And I remember asking myself, wouldn't it be more efficient? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be more efficient if uh, they put all their tomato plants in one section of their field? And um, I saw a gigantic cucumber, four inches thick. It had been on the vine so long that it had started to go to seed and turn yellow. Uh, in my eyes, this farmer had waited too long to pick his cucumber. And in my mind, I decided that on that day that that farmer was not a good farmer. Um, but as I've watched these Hmong farmers harvest and sell the uh, you know, three quarters of a million pounds of produce year in and year out, um, these farmers are anything but lazy. Um, Traditional American farming, traditional Western farmers use techniques handed down from Europe. And so, you know, the laser straight rows that I was talking about on a farm, they exist because you had, people had horses or oxen and, or, and later tractors and they needed a place for the tires or the hooves of the animal to, to, to go forward without trampling any plants. Um, the Hmong farmers don't have that tradition. Uh, they've, they've come from a, a tradition where they've largely planted and harvested everything by hand. Um, the Hmong farmers have discovered that certain leafy vegetables like collard greens um, don't like to be confined in orderly rows. They've decided, they've, they, they've discovered that uh, um, nature kind of likes randomness. And so when you have a patch of things growing like this, um, there is less competition for sunlight this way than in, uh, in a row. And so what happens is that instead of reaching up for sunlight, um, a lot of the collard greens will just go fat and wide, and that's a quality of uh, collard greens that our, our customers have come to, to appreciate. So um, they've also discovered that uh, Pests are easier to control if you don't have all your tomatoes in one section of the farm. Uh, if I'm a horde of tomato eating pests, I want to land on the all you can eat buffet. I want to land on you know acres and acres of the same thing. Uh, if you have to land on a few tomato plants, hop over some things that you don't like to get to another section of tomato plants, you're not going to have the pest pressure that uh, you get from monocropping. 
um, and that huge cucumber. I've discovered that uh, we in the West like to eat our cucumbers pretty young. Uh, there are whole populations in Asia that actually like an overripe cucumber. Um, you know, if you any, have, have any, if any of you garden um, next season, just um, try to plant and just let one cucumber <laughs> sit there. It's a completely different vegetable. It's uh, almost custard-like. It's not crunchy and green. Um, and it's, it's really good. So in 2005, we started losing about five farmers. And in 2006, I lost another five farmers. And uh, before long, my 40, uh, 38 farmer, farmer's market was down to about 20 farmers. And um, I got alarmed, and I decided to investigate why. And I found that the Hmong farmers were paying up to $450 an acre a season, when the going rate for a mainstream farmer is $85 to $100 an acre. Uh, they were renting remnant land, that is land that a corn and soy farmer knew would flood a lot if, if, if it rained really hard or you know, had some, some other sort of issue, bad soil, handshake leases. Uh, they were on their land for only a year, and then they would move on which explained why at my farmer's market we didn't have any perennials. We didn't have strawberries, we didn't have garlic, we didn't have asparagus, uh, rhubarb. Um, so in response to the land shortages uh, that, that our farmers were facing, we, just, we decided to start a farm in nearby Port Washington to stabilize things and to introduce uh, new crops that our customers said they want, like strawberries and perennials. Um, here's a map of the farm. We've just uh, divided it into uh, 20 plots. We have 11 farmers. Um, we put in an irrigation well. This thing has to go down 40 stories uh, to come up with 250 gallons a minute. Uh, imagine filling 250 gallons of milk in a minute. That's a lot of water. Um, and the first water came out just in the nick of time in July of 2012 with, our, with the big drought. We had an era, uh, 1950s era Alice Chalmers tractor. We converted it to electric. The uh, cost goes down to $7 a year uh, fuel costs. It's just a battery in the back. Um, we have, also have a farm all cub. Uh, these, these small tractors are perfect size for a farmer that, uh, that we're talking about. And um, no one in America is making a farmer uh, a tractor this small anymore. Uh, tractors this small are being made in Europe. So what a small farmer is to do here is uh, they have to use these um, ancient looking tractors. Uh, and then we have an uh, international harvester diesel for the big jobs. We have a seeding transplanter. We've had a lot of interest from the local farming community. Um, we've had some vandalism. Um, in Port Washington, there are a lot of um, uh, summer lake homes, and someone kept knocking over our porta potty, so I bought this uh, infrared motion sensor to catch whoever was doing it. And this is the only thing <laughs> I caught. Um, but so um, the land was in corn and soy production for decades. And so um, in the first year, we saw almost no wildlife. And then so, and, but two years ago, we started seeing some wildlife coming back, like this um, turtle. Uh, we've started experimenting with uh, fresh ginger. Um, pot, uh, restaurants are, are going nuts for that. Schlitz, the beer that Milwaukee, made Milwaukee famous. Uh, we've started growing hops. This is not a picture of our farm. Our hops did not grow that well, uh, but that's how we hope it to be. This is uh, the, the hops yard going in. We've started bending, we started bending poles and we had a, a hoop house building session where we uh, put up a hoop house to extend the season uh, it is possible to grow spinach in this weather. Um, and eventually, we would like for the farmer's market to go to being year-round. Um, but um, so this is the first step towards that. 
Onions. This is an onion about the size of a baby's head. Onions do really well on our farm. So uh, my final Mount Stupid moment that I'll, I'll leave you with, you know, I thought that farmers, the best farmers were really efficient. They did a lot of work with minimal effort. Um, they were profitable. Farmers knew what goes into each product in terms of expenses, know exactly what crops are the most profitable so that they can um, you know, make the most money. And good farmers uh, know how to reduce their risks. Good farmers take out uh, crop insurance, for example, um, to safeguard against disaster. But what about the other aspects of farming that are harder to measure? Um, like personal happiness, social connectedness, and mental health. Uh, this is not to say profit isn't important, but those of us working with small farmers need to pay attention to the other things that are not so easily counted. Um, for example, um, other techniques and farming possibilities. Um, one of the things that, if I can go back to this illustration, Farm, our Hmong farmers know how to reduce their risks. Um, one of the things that they do is they overplant. And it, it has been a source of frustration for us until it suddenly dawned on us that, you know, the Hmong come from a, um, an, an agrarian tradition where you did not have um, uh, crop insurance. So if, if you, there was a lot of uncertainty about how much water you were going to get, you overplanted. And so that uh, over planting, then you were at least guaranteed some uh, things to harvest. Um, the Hmong and tractors. Um, you know, tractors are expensive. They cost money. They break down. The most, uh, the most reliable piece of equipment that a farmer has really is, are their backs and their arms and uh, their legs. Um, so there are many different ways to farm. Buckwheat, this is a, uh, a picture of buckwheat. We planted buckwheat as crop cover, and um, once the crop cover had taken place, we just mowed it. And then one day um, after we mowed it, a farmer came up to us in tears. Her family used to grow buckwheat in Southeast Asia. She hadn't seen buckwheat in America. And she came, walked up to me going, why did you cut down those white flowers? Um, they would harvest that buckwheat um, so, and, and make um, a, a delicacy out of buckwheat uh, flour. And um, you know, there, there are just many ways of looking at plants and their purpose. Carrots. I used to say to my Hmong farmers, um, wouldn't you rather sell, wouldn't you rather deliver a whole case of carrots to a restaurant, get paid, go home, go back to the fields and work some more, wouldn't it be more efficient to make um, one massive delivery to a grocery store rather than sitting around at the farmer's market all day um, selling carrots one at a time? And um, what I've learned is that the farmers like sitting around the farmer's market, um, gossiping with their neighbors, having their son meet uh, this nice daughter uh, that they want him to meet. Um, there's a lot of things going on at the farmer's market, things that are, that are social, that really hold a community together. And so they would rather sell one carrot at a time because that time uh, at the market is spent um, getting to, you know, staying connected with the community. Um, farmers have started growing Jerusalem artichokes, not because they can make money, but because they like the flowers. Uh, you cannot underestimate the power of being your own boss. And then I've also learned that coercion rarely works in the long run, especially with farmers. Uh, when I started the farm project, I said, we're going to form a co-op, guys. And they would just look at me and, you know, kind of roll their eyes. Well, what happened was that we got some wholesale customers, though. And we started making deliveries last year. And each farmer made about $5,000 each um, by selling. And um, it was not something that they had thought about doing. But um, 
you know, we're going to do it again this year, this coming season, on a larger scale. And eventually, my hope is that I can go to them and say, look, you guys, you guys are acting like a cooperative. Why don't we form a cooperative? I think that's the way to work with a community, not say, you're going to, I'm going to make you uh, form, a co uh, form a cooperative. I'm not going to make this kid eat broccoli. Um, so in terms of resiliency, you know, we could build an organization that is entirely dependent on, on you know, that's more based on a hub, more based on, on uh, the Fondi Food Center, more based on me. Uh, really, what I think we need to do if we are to build a system that is more resilient is to come up with nodes where um, things are less centralized, less dependent on one person. Um, so that, um, you know, if something happens to one entity, the, the system can continue to go. And so finally, um, I've learned that knowing who you're trying to help is really important. Um, inner city of Milwaukee has a long history of, um, of problems, but uh, if you're interested in a better food system, you need to include neighborhood histories and experiences. Um, and if you can stay local um, and realize that what works in Milwaukee may not work in Detroit, may not work in Chicago, but each neighborhood, each city has a different history. You know, Detroit has the car industry. Milwaukee has Master Lock and, and the breweries. Um, so what I think we need is not a uniform blanket, a new uniform solution. Um, a uniform blanket uh, woven out of one thread, but really a quilt that reflects uh, histories uh, neighborhood by neighborhood in Milwaukee. And so um, that's what I've learned. Any, any questions? Yes, and I'll, I'll repeat the question for the benefit of the uh, TV cameras. Yes. Um, what do you think of uh, sort of urban agriculture? I, I noticed that your farms are outside of the city. Yes. And so, uh, what are the possibilities for you know taking over vacant lots, or is that okay? Sort of, uh, well, uh, yeah. The question was about urban agriculture and and my thoughts on urban ag agriculture and what it can do for uh, food availability essentially. Um, urban agriculture is, it certainly has a piece in this puzzle. Um, I've, we haven't really attacked it that hard because um, there is only so much you can grow on a quarter acre or a half acre. Most of our farmers, they start at around four acres and go up to 10 acres. Uh, if you want to be um, sustainable financially, there needs to be some volume. And so urban agriculture, um, I think, is a proving ground for people who are new to agriculture. Um, you know, there are a lot of 20-somethings coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm sure Illinois, um, with English degrees that want to be farmers. And it's, it's actually quite uh, intriguing, and it's, um, it's gratifying to see this new, new uh, population of farmers. Um, but you have to start small and learn the basics before you can really graduate to big, big uh, quantities. The other thing about urban agriculture that um, a lot of the practitioners, a lot of the proponents of urban agriculture, and I, I, and I won't say all of them, but a lot have this idea that growing your own food is a good idea, which is good but it kind of skips the reality, at least in Milwaukee, um, that a lot of inner city Milwaukee moved to Milwaukee from the south to get away from farming, sharecropping, and before that, slavery. Um, people, not everyone has a positive experience with agri agriculture. And so for someone to just waltz into a neighborhood and say, hi, I'm gonna teach you how to grow cabbage, um, Maybe they had a relative who said, you know, we've moved to Milwaukee so we wouldn't have to farm ever again. So that there, there, are some he there is a healing step that has to happen before a community can, can, really, a community can really go back to, to uh, farming. 
so, but it has a lot of promise. So, I think here, and I'm just going to work my way back. Well, my yes. Really, a question I just heard the other day. I uh, was listening to a program about food, and they said that collard greens have a new kale. So yeah. It's it's an amazing vegetable. It, it really is. Um, and uh, you want to start an argument in in the in, in the neighborhood um, where I work is you know, ask some ask a group of people what's the best way to prepare collard greens. They all have their own secret. Um, but it's it's a food. It's a dish that means family. And. Um, one illustration of how powerful food can be. Um, this past Thanksgiving, I ate uh, Thanksgiving at my, at my sister's place for the first time. And uh, I grew up in a Korean household where uh, my mom didn't really know what to do with cranberries. So she, she, she got a can of jellied cranberries and just kind of plopped it onto a plate. And, um, you know, she tried to cut it up, but you could still see the lines from the can lining, you know. And I hadn't seen that since I uh, moved out of the house. And then I was at my sister's house, and there it was. You know, <laughs> canned, jellied, just straight jellied. I mean, you couldn't even make out the cranberries. And I said, wow, this is Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and back there. Um, I just had a, a comment and a question. Uh -huh. so I really appreciate the first part of your presentation where you talked about nutrition education yeah. and um, just really being uh, sensitive and uh, um, conscientious of the framework that we keep reinforcing, you know, for to not reinforce like stereotypes of yeah. Like, yeah. who knows what about food. Um, so I work in uh, food security here in, in Chicago on the Northwest side. And I work with urban growers, but I also work with food pantries. Yeah. And so I just wanted to know if you also work with food pantries and, um, and like how that looks or if there's any relationship. Um, after that experience, no, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gone back to food pantries. I felt like, um, I felt like the food skills were already there, at least in, in, the, in my neighborhood. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, I have this dream, for example, of having something called the Fondy Iron Chef, uh, where I get two neighborhood cooks going head to head. Uh, I'd like to build a kind of a cooking amphitheater where, you know, I have two stoves, I hand two guys $10 each, I say, come back here in 15 minutes, we'll start cooking. And then I get an MC kind of like on Iron Chef and get a, you know, some people standing around watching them cook and competing and then having a, a March Madness kind of bracket where at the end of the growing season you have a, a champion and, you know, a big trophy and a big, big to-do. Um, I think that's the kind of, of uh, where, you, where you just inspire people. Uh, where someone, say a, a, a kid watching, sees someone who looks kind of like them that, that they understand cooking and that maybe they can get inspired to go back home and ask grandma, you know, how do you make this or how do you make that or what, you know, that, that there's just so much richness that um, not just in my community but communities all over we're losing food knowledge um, every time uh, um, grandparent passes away. It's like a, a, a whole library burning to the ground. Um, there is a lot of food knowledge and memory that uh, if we don't try to capture that, uh, it's lost. So um, I think food conversations, ways to, um, because people know when they're being talked down to. I think the people in the food pantry knew, <laughs> and here's this guy who thinks he's going to teach us something about cooking. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there has to be a partnership. There can't be a power imbalance. Um, so it's, and I think it depends on uh, each neighborhood and what people are interested in doing. Yes? Is there a similarity between the amount of growing different 
crops together and say some of the Native Americans that grew corn, squash, and beans together? Um, the question was, is there a similarity between the Hmong and the Native Americans who also did some interesting crop planting patterns? I don't know. I'm not, I, I'm not an expert. I, I just know that it's a, it's a smart way to plant, um, not putting all of your eggs in one basket, uh, not confining all of your cucumbers to one section and so that they can be taken out overnight by, uh, by uh, pests. So. Um, so I, I really don't know. So yes, in back there. I'm a native of Milwaukee myself, but there's um, a large group of Mexico on the weekend during the week at the West Dallas Farmers Market. Yes. Headed Ice Arena, State Fair Park, the Public Market downtown, Wallapilla. It seems like there's a lot of potential. But the interfaith community deals a lot with um, perhaps cannabis, but not the vegetables, perhaps what your mission is. It seems like there's a lot of opportunity and potential. What was your tenure, long term strategy, or goal? Can you elaborate a little bit? Long term strategy around what? What was your long term strategy for your organization? Long term, if, if I'm really dreaming here, um, I would like for me to not have to exist. I mean, the, my organization, I should say. Um, every, I really believe philosophically that um, an organization that's, that's started to address a problem should be trying to put itself out of business. And um, I would like to think that we could get to the point where there's just so much sharing of recipes and, and cooking knowledge within the neighborhood that I don't have to write grants to fund a cooking demonstration program at the farmer's market. Um, I would like for there to be so much business at the farmer's market that uh, we can gradually charge higher and higher rents so that you know, you know most of the farmer's market is still grant funded. So we're talking about true, true economic sustainability, not just environmental and social, but uh, economic sustainability so that um, you know, the Fondue Food Center doesn't have to exist. It doesn't have to be a 501c3. Maybe it can, can transition to a for-profit. Um, long term, that's, that's what I would love to see. I don't know if I'll see that, though. Uh, there's just so much to do. Um, but, you know, this whole food network revolution, you know, when I was growing up, it was Julia Child, that was it. Um, and now you have all these cooking stars, all of the, there's so much interest around food. Um, in community meetings uh, on the north side of Milwaukee, the questions that are being asked are, so, are surprisingly sophisticated around GMOs, around uh, you know, genetically modified foods. Um, you know, people are aware and um, they, they, they want to know where their food is coming from. And so um, it is happening. Uh, long term, long term, the solution is jobs and economic opportunity. And that's um, one way to do it is through farming. Uh, that's one opportunity that people would have. Um, but, you know, economic prosperity then answers a lot of the questions, a lot of the problems that we're, we're faced with, a lack of uh, full service grocery stores, for example. Um, so. I'm sure PhDs could be written on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Since uh, you're farmer, Mark, have you found um, an impact that you have made in the community as far as diet-related diseases? Since there's more availability of fresh food. Um, yeah. The question was. Um, is there a demonstrated impact that our farmer's market is having on the community as far as fruit and vegetable consumption? And probably the decrease in diet-related disease. Diet-related disease. That is really hard for us to track, and we have not been able to come up with um, measures that ask for that data in an, an obtrusive way. Um, you would have to go and ask someone how many veg, you know, how, what did you eat today? Um, there are other ways of doing that. Now, now since the, in the past 10 years, uh, there is data 
that shows that uh, vegetable consumption is increasing in the three zip code area where our farmers market is. I just don't know if that's attributable to the farmers market being there. Um, but you know, it's three quarters of a million pounds of produce you would think and 85% of our customers come from uh, the three zip code area. Um, but it's, I can't tie it to my farmer's market. Um, that's a tough one. Yes, question back. I want to ask you about the land that, that you bought. Yes. You bought, um, and do the, are all the farmers among farmers there and do they pay for that? Okay, about the farm, are all the farmers Hmong and do they pay rent? Uh, let's see, eight of the farmers are Hmong. I, um, half of them are women-headed uh, farming operations. Um, we have an Irish-American woman farmer who is um, also farming there. We also have two groups of uh, youngsters from the neighborhood. Uh, one of them is called MOVE, M-O-V-E, More Organic Vegetables Everywhere. Um, you know, they want to be farmers. And uh, they come from a, a, group, um, a group of people, an organization called Alice's Garden. And Alice's Garden is headed up by um, a community group. And uh, when I first met Alice's Garden, they, uh, they had set up what they called a slave garden. And I said, really, slave garden, you're going to go there? And he said, yes. They said, yes, we have to talk about how agriculture has treated us. We have to show uh, the youth um, what agri agriculture meant for our community. And so they've gone through that process. And these you know, kids have, have said, well, you know, I like growing things. Um, I would like to grow things. So um, some of the kids from our farm, they actually started distributing produce to some of the corner stores. Um, this pa uh, the past two years, and uh, they're going to do it again this year. Uh, the hope is that eventually it gets big enough that uh, we can afford to uh, have a centralized cooler somewhere where we can store vegetables um, in the neighborhood. And this is uh, income that stays in the neighborhood. It doesn't go to wherever the big corporate grocery stores are. Yes. Uh, does the city or state help our farmers market? No. Yeah, we are a standalone 501c3 nonprofit. Um, there are grants every now and then that you can apply for from the state, but um, no, it's 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 a nonprofit. Um, yeah. I want to thank you, Jan, and thank our. Thank audience. you. Appreciate it.